Hello, everybody, and welcome to WEC Talk, the podcast series from the FIA World Endurance Championship. I'm Martin Haven. In the second episode of our 2021 season, we meet a name that's brand new to World Endurance, Glickenhaus. The name, like Ferrari perhaps, or Lamborghini, is shared by both a man and his creations, the latest of which is the newest challenger to break cover in the top flight of endurance racing, Hypercar. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, so let's rewind a little to bring everybody up to speed and say hello, first of all, to the man behind the machines. Welcome, James Glickenhaus. Jim, hello. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, Jim, you must surely be the only car manufacturer based in New York now, right? Uh, Yes, we are actually the only um, manufacturer in New York. There used to be manufacturers. Uh, Rolls-Royce made the... uh, uh, Bruce in Brewster, they made a, uh, a Rolls Royce there and General Motors for many years made uh, minivans actually in Tarrytown. So, uh, but they all closed up and uh, against long odds, we are a uh, manufacturer. We are recognized by NHTSA. Our cars are fully world legal. Uh, they are EPA and CARB compliant. They're fully tested. And uh, we just set up a factory in uh, Danbury at the airport where I am actually actually now, and uh, we are beginning to build uh, cars for customers and to deliver them. So what we're talking about here, the names I mentioned before, Enzo Ferrari, Ferruccio Lamborghini, it is similar because you're not just a race team. You do produce road cars, road supercars as well. It's very important to us to um, take what we learn from racing and to turn it into great road cars. I mean, we really believe that a sports car can be proven at the uh, 24 hours of Nürburgring and um, that our off on-road truck, uh, the Glickenhaus boot can show its metal if it can finish the Baja 1000. I mean, we love vehicles as they used to be. I mean, in the wonderful days of the 60s you could buy an mgb in austin healy if you had a little more money a jaguar a porsche or a ferrari and you could drive it up to uh, your local track tape the headlights and go racing and drive home and we love those days and they've been very important to us and that's what we try to do Where did all of this passion for automobiles start with you? Was it a family thing? Did you inherit it from your father? Is it genetic? Uh, My father uh, was a great supporter of anything I wanted to do, but he really had no interest in cars. I mean, I remember when it came time to buy a new car, he said, Jim, well, just go to bicycle down to the Chevy dealer and pick something out for me. So I would do that. And I also would bicycle because the most beautiful cars in my mind uh, were Ferraris. So when I was about 10 years old, I would bicycle uh, almost 15, 20 miles to Mr. Kennedy's dealership in Greenwich. And I'd stand outside with my nose pressed against the glass. And eventually, um, Mr. Kennedy um, invited me in and he begrudgingly would let me look at the cars and then sit in the cars and then touch the steering wheel. And over the years, um, I went there very often and I learned a lot. And um, I watched him take, uh, you know, things like 250 LMs that arrived at a shop and he said they really needed a lot of work to make them competitive. And he and his mechanics would work on them. And then he would send me running for parts. I remember going to the speed shop and buying um, hot rod ignition wires for that 275 LM that eventually uh, he raced successfully at Le Mans in 1965. It finished first overall. And actually that was the last time Ferrari finished first overall at Le Mans. But I asked Mr. Canetti, you know, why he was replacing the Ferrari ignition wires. And he said, because they're crap. And, you know, that gave me a very interesting view into what made race cars fast and how they could always be improved. And we're we're, we're tying all sorts of spine tingling threads together here because, of course, as you say, 65 Luigi Canetti, who was Ferrari's U.S. importer, North American racing team was his brainchild raced not only in the States, but also took cars to Le Mans and across the world. 67, the last victory for a U.S. built 
car at Le Mans. And that's something that rankles with you still, isn't it? That 67 is quite a while ago since the US car won overall at the start. Yes, it is. And, you know, um, as I got older and I, I began writing and directing movies and um, the second one I made, The Exterminator, was actually fairly successful. Uh, I took what any young kid would do is I took half the money I made from writing and directing The Exterminator and I um, gave it to my dad who was in Wall Street to invest and I took the other half and I bought a, a used Ferrari. And this um, was really the beginning of my collection. And um, as time went on, I kept doing it. And I was very lucky to actually eventually acquire uh, the Ford Mark IV that um, Bruce McLaren and Mark Donahue drove to fourth overall at Le Mans in 67. And I learned a tremendous amount from that car. Um, in those days, Ferrari made very beautiful cars, such as the P3-4s, the 412 ps and the P4s. But the uh, thing about Ford was they really took things to another level. They stopped the B1 bomber line and they built the first um, carbon honeycomb composite tub. They used IBM mainframe computers to map out Le Mans digitally. And they realized that if they ran at 6,200 RPMs, they would win the race. So it was really the beginning of technology. And that car was in fact, the uh, last car made entirely in America to win the 24 hours of Le Mans, unlike the earlier ones, which were built, built basically in the UK, shipped over to the United States, modified by people like Holman, Moody and Shelby. But uh, it's a very special car. And then I was also able to acquire the P34 that Chris Amon and Lorenzo Bandini drove to first place at Daytona and comparing those two cars was really an enormous lesson. Uh, Ferraris are incredibly lightweight. The oil and the um, water travel in inside of chassis tubes, which gives them lightweight, but also frankly makes them uncomfortable to drive because you're in a cockpit where your leg, if it reaches out, it hits a hot oil line. Um, you know, the one thing I was lucky to meet Mark Donahue that Mark told me was that the great thing about the Ford Mark IV was that it was like driving a big Cadillac. He said, I could get out of a stint and I was totally relaxed. He said the windshield wiper was out of a UE helicopter. It had comfortable seats, great vision. The, the windshield, he missed it. He said the guys would get out of the Ferrari and they would fall on the ground. They were so beaten up physically. And this was a lesson that I really learned as I went on and we began modifying at first um, the GT2 Ferrari that became a P45 Competizione and then eventually building from the ground up our own cars like our 003 uh, that we raced at the Nürburgring, or 004 that we raced at the Nürburgring, our 007 that we're going to race in the WEC and Le Mans, and our uh, Glickenhaus boot. So these were some of the lessons that I learned. And the final thing I'll say about that is I always love pretty cars. And, you know, when I looked at the regulations for hypercar, they were very specific as to how much downforce you could make, um, what the car had to weigh, what your engine capacity was. But within those rules, I still tried to make a pretty car because the first car I fell in love with was my Lola T70. That's how I met Mark Donahue. It was an ex Donahue Penske car, weirdly wound up with Andy Warhol and I bought it from him. But it was the first race car. It was a Can-Am uh, open race car that won eight major races. And my dream was to drive these things on the road. And that's when I, my first road conversion. So I think of my T70 as sort of uh, SCG001. And that's what I try to do now. I try to make cars that are dream versions of sports cars that fans can look at and they can say, I understand that. I want that. I want a poster of it on my wall. Well, you mentioned some of the world's toughest endurance races that you've competed at regularly, and, and particularly the Nürburgring 24 hours, most racing fans will know of. But the Baja 1000, in 2020, for the second year in a row, you beat Ford in Class 2. You won your class 
in the Baja 1000, you won your class in the Nürburgring 24 hours as well. Now the Green Hell and the Baja Peninsula, to most people, there's not a great deal of crossover there. Do, do they cross infect each other? All of these things that you learn from, from the desert and, and well, Nürburgring from the rain and the, and the hail and the, and the cold and, and the fog. They, they absolutely do. I mean, I think the first thing that makes a great endurance car is that it's comfortable, that you can see out of it, that it's not so loud inside that it's deafening, that you can talk on the radio, that the controls are easy and logical to reach and to use. And I think if that, if you start with that, you will be a lot faster than a car that uh, doesn't have those attributes. The one thing about the toughest endurance races in the world, and I think it's fair to say that the Baja 1000 and the 24 hours of Nürburgring are brutal, brutal races are. They teach you everything. I mean, in the Nürburgring, you can start off in beautiful sunshine, go around the course, hit pouring rain, and even one year when you were there, I think we had hail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you encounter everything. And the other thing is you learn the basic things that make a car work. Can you keep the engine cool? Can you keep the cockpit cool so that the drivers feel comfortable? Can you keep a steering system that provides the feedback that people need to drive quickly, but that will not deteriorate over 24 brutal hours? Um, is the car easy to work on? Is it modular? I mean, one year when we were winning the race, um, we uh, had an incident where we broke one headlight and it took us 16 minutes in the pit to fix, to change the nose and the headlight. We finished eight minutes behind the lead car. So if that hadn't have happened, we would have won the race by a substantial margin. So next year we redesigned in our 004 where the entire clip both headlights and everything come on and off with two clips and we can now change the entire front nose of the car in 16 seconds. So we learn from our mistakes and that's what we do. Um, but the Baja is like really frankly as it was in the 60s. I mean, when you drive down in the Baja, you're driving with the ghosts of people like Steve McQueen and the great people who went down there to try to conquer the peninsula and it really teaches you a lot they say you learn nothing from winning and everything from losing and and that's so true isn't it when you're developing machinery that every time something trips you up right we fix that next time that won't get us no, that's exactly it. And um, I remember that the first year we raced P45 Competizione, which was basically a Ferrari GT2 chassis. And at the end of the race, we could not have gone another lap. The entire left rear of the car, the chassis was just coming apart. The stress of driving the 24 hours of Nuremberg ring was too much for it. So we completely uh, strengthened the chassis, redid it, uh, modified it. And the next year we came back and um, finished 12th overall, which for um, a car in the SPX was um, really pretty cool. You are starting very early in the hypercar program. Only Toyota have, have actually started their program before you. There will be other rivals. Uh, Peugeot are coming. Oh, and Audi and Porsche and Ferrari uh, have already announced programs. Do you think that being early to the game gives you some advantage? Well, I think it's... Um... It's a very complex question. I think, first of all, you have to differentiate between Le Mans hypercars and the IMSA LMDHs. They're really two completely different animals. The Le Mans hypercars, um, you're basically starting with a clean sheet of paper and a set of rules. Uh, the LMDHs are, if you will, um, LMP2 uh, 2.0s. So while you you have two cars that will be racing under convergence against each other. They are quite different. You also have within Le Mans hypercar all wheel drive and two wheel drive. So the uh, question is, which is the better way to go? 
if there was not BOP, you of course would go the route Toyota did. That car will be faster. It will have less tire degradation and it will be able to probably come out of the turns faster than an ice only engine. Even though we are spending a lot of energy on developing um, artificial intelligence throttle systems that will keep the uh, revs up to keep the uh, engine, the turbos charged at their peak. So we think we'll mitigate a little of that. However, with BOP, uh, quite frankly, the ACL and the WEC are going to have to find a way to uh, figure that out. I mean, for example, let's take tires. Because of the uh, better wear that you get with all-wheel drive, the Toyotas, quite frankly, could possibly go four stints on one set of tires. We believe, and Michelin believes, that in the beginning, we're going to be going about two stints. Okay, so that means that we are going to have to pit. Uh, we are going to have 20 seconds more of pit time over four stints. Now, how will they deal with that with BOP? They've already given Toyota a little more weight than us. They gave them 10 kilos. But I think in fairness to the ACO and the WEC, they are really asking a lot of very good questions. How light can we possibly be? And quite frankly, um, we can probably be 120 or even 130 kilos under the minimum. They also have asked us, how much power could you run with if we needed to increase your power? And uh, quite frankly, uh, we feel comfortable that we could run with 20% more power than the um, standard power there that they're talking about. Uh, our people engine, it, which is uh, developed by people from the ground up based on their WRC experience, on the uh, dyno in endurance tune or time attack tune can make 1400 horsepower. So for us to make 750 horsepower in endurance tune for 30 hours is a non-issue. Now, how will they balance 20 seconds over four stints? Well, they can make Toyota sit in the pits five seconds longer each stop uh, than we do. But I, I think, uh, or 20 seconds, you know, every four stints. But um, I don't think that the fans would like that and that would be terrible. So weirdly, they kind of have to make us a little faster than Toyota over the four stints so that we will gain back those 20 seconds over four stints and every four stints um, will be equal. Now, when I say all of this, this is just me thinking out loud. I have no idea what's going through their minds or how they're going to do it. I'm just trying to say some of the issues that are real and will have to be dealt with. When we get to Le Mans uh, LMDH, the IMSA cars, um, to be honest with you, I think it will be even more difficult to have an equal BOP because let's look at those cars. They will be rear wheel drive, so they will not have the advantage of the all wheel drive um, tires, which will degrade less. In addition, when you have curves in the back, when you have a hybrid unit, which I believe is a 40 horsepower spec hybrid unit that they are going to bolt onto their power plants, but it's in the rear, it is not the best place to put a hybrid unit. Where Toyota puts it over the front wheels is, is great because it doesn't affect the balance of the car. So right off the bat, the LMDHs are going to have the problem of battery weight, battery complexity, a spec hybrid unit being, frankly, in my opinion, not in the best place in the car. And they're going to be two wheel drive. So they'll have the tire degradation issues that we will have being ice only. But interestingly, I think they will have a bigger problem because when the hybrid unit kicks in, it's 100% torque, it's zero RPM. And that is a little rougher on the tires than as it builds through an ice engine. So, you know, what will happen? Let's look at those manufacturers you spoke of. Porsche and Audi 
of, have announced that they will be uh, LMDH. So their architecture is going to be quite a bit different than ours. Their basic design of the car, while they may have individual branding bits, it's not going to be the same design freedom that you have in Le Mans hypercar. So when you speak of Toyota, um, us, um, Peugeot and Ferrari, they will have a lot more freedom to design whatever suits their fancy and uh, make very fast cars. And yet the ACO and the WEC are going to have to put this, um, these ingredients uh, the, in, and make a bouillabaisse out of them. So it'll be very interesting. It's such a broad church. Can we build a prototype? Yes, you can. Can we base it on road car? We need to base it on road car. Yes, you can do that. We need hybrid. You can have hybrid. We don't want hybrid. You don't have to have hybrid. There's an awful lot going on there that, that they're trying to balance out. Now, bearing in mind that you had the engine running early this year, you've done a few shakedowns, you've, you've run the car at Monza. With Portimao now being moved to later in the year and, and the the prologue and the first race being at Spa at the beginning of May, that's precious breathing space for a new project like yours, right? Well, it is, but to be honest with you, um, you know, we're under no pressure to do anything but what we want to do. You know, I think that there are a lot of internet pundits who assume a lot of things. I mean, we can do what we want. I'm going to Le Mans because it's been a dream of mine for 50 years. And I am gonna stand in the rain at night at Le Mans and watch a car with my name on it go down the Mont Saint. That's enough for me to be honest with you. I mean, I, and I'm gonna go when I think I have a car that can really be worthy of going to Le Mans and is going to really be a cool car and might even have a chance to win. If we do, fantastic. If we don't, who cares? I mean, literally, to me, destinations come and go. It's the journey I remember. I mean, I'll never forget the rainy day in Greenwich, Connecticut, when Mr. Kennedy looked at me and said, kid, you're going to bike home in the rain. You're going to get wet. And I said, oh, it's OK. And he said, well, you didn't bring a jacket. And I said, oh, it's OK. And he reached up on the wall and he took a Ferrari Nart team jacket and he gave it to me and he said, here, wear this. You know, those are the things I remember. Um, and that's and that's what matters to me. Now, in terms of time, you know, we are completely on track. Um, you guys will officially announce this. So hopefully by the time the podcast comes out, I'm, I'm not tipping anything that's not official, but we, we have passed all of the required crash tests. We um, have tested the car at Monza with Sauber uh, it, with different modifications to the diffuser and the wings to settle on our final car, because as you know, you have set limits, but you, and you can't change during the year. So you can't have a low downforce car for some tracks and a high downforce car for other tracks. So you have to make your decision. And now we know what our VMAX is. We know what our lap times are at Monza. We um, have done coast down tests uh, with uh, our drivers. So we know what our mathematics are versus the reality of our aero. And we're totally ready to lock the car and go into our final aero configuration. And then the car will be homologated. But here's what we're going to be doing. This weekend, I'm going to be flying to Europe. And on Monday and Tuesday, we'll be testing uh, the 007 at Vallelunga for the second time at Vallelunga. In addition, I'm going to have an 004C uh, that we raced last year at the 24 Hours of Nuremberg Room that we've done extensive evoing on. We wanted to get a little more front, front down force, and we changed the steering system. And that car, I think, is going to be incredibly uh, competitive. I think we honestly have a real chance to win the 24 Hours of Nuremberg Ring this year. We're going to have an 004S road mule, so I can drive that around. We're going to have an 003 S road car we can drive around. We'll have uh, friends, family, customers, and press, and uh, we'll learn a lot over those two days. I'm going to climb in the 007 and uh, try not to crash it, uh, but and then I think I'll be able to do that. And then um, two about uh, ten days later, we're going to go to Monza. 
and test. And then we're going to go about 10 days after that to Aragon in mid-April, and we're going to do a 30-hour endurance test on the car. And if that all goes well, which we think it will, we will then final homologate uh, the aero on the car, and we will show up at Spa uh, with two 007s ready to race. We'll have Spa to race. We'll have Portimao to race. We'll have Monza to race, all to get ready for Le Mans. And we'll go to Le Mans and uh, see what happens. Jim, there's no logic to any of this. It's, it's all about passion. It's all about heart. And nobody hearing you talk could doubt that that is dripping from every pore. So I'm absolutely certain you're going to find a very warm welcome in the World Endurance Paddock. And from the fans as well, whenever we get them back on track and whoever's watching online or on the TV, you know, we're infected with this crazy drug and, and you've got it bad, my friend. You've got it really bad. Well, this is this is exactly it. I mean, against crazy odds, last week we had five million social media interactions on our various accounts. Now, this is frankly in this brave new world of ours, what matters? Are the fans interested? Do they like it? Are they going to tune in to watch the races if we're there? I mean, you know, I took out a thing and I said, look, we possibly could build a third car for Le Mans. And um, if you're interested, give us a call and we'll sell you a car and we'll help you race it at Le Mans. You know, and immediately on the Internet, people say, oh, well, you're not on the list. And, you know, how are you going to get a place? And uh, I mean, look, here, here's the truth. If, in fact, someone wants to pay for a third car, we'll call up the ACO and we'll say, hey, we could show up with a third car. And if we do and are allowed to, it's going to get us money to continue racing in the WEC, to come back stronger next year. You know, can we figure this out? I mean, I don't think there are any rules anymore. I, I really don't. Um, we need fans. We need people to be engaged. And, you know, in the days of the 60s, which were the glory days, you had the prototypes like the Lolas, the P4s and the Mark IVs. You had the um, two liter cars with like the, uh, the Ferrari Dinos, the 908 Porsches, 906 Porsches, which were sort of like at half the engine capacity of the prototypes, but they still were very beautiful cars. And then you had the sports cars. I really think that hypercar has the chance to make cool looking, beautiful cars again. I really hope that uh, Porsche and Audi can get their designers to add a certain je ne sais quoi to their LMDHs. I personally think that it would be much more exciting if the Le Mans LMP2s were forced to make themselves visually a little more interesting. And I think it's gonna be great when both at, when the WEC follows IMSA's lead and gets rid of GTE, which is way too expensive, and goes to GT3 so that we can see the glory days of every sports car company in the world showing up and racing each other. So I'm very optimistic, but you know, a, a lot of people who ask questions like, well, how can you possibly think that you could get a third car on the grid this year? You're not on the reserve list or you're not on this. I don't think they quite realize uh, that, that we're all in uncharted waters. And if we don't work together to find <laughs> solutions, uh, you know, fans are going to go elsewhere and there won't be ice cars and there won't be racing and uh, the world will be a bit different. But we'll still be here doing our thing, even if we're racing in the parking lot at the Danbury Airport. Well, as a film director, you made a career out of creating events from just thin air and an idea. And you are doing exactly the same now, not with celluloid, but with gasoline, Jim. Can't wait to see the car at Spa. Really, I'm sure I, uh, everybody echoes this. Wishing you the very best of luck, you and the team. We can't wait to see it running. Thank you so much. And, and that's exactly it. I mean, we're not racing. We're making performance art that happens to be racing. And uh, to me, I think that's uh, a cool thing.
We've heard from the creator of this project about the concept of the car. Now it's time to learn a little bit more about it dynamically. So let's welcome one of the team's drivers, Ryan Briscoe. Ryan, you're just about to leave home in the States to go testing in Italy next week. So what's been your reaction to the 007 so far? Well, it's been great. I mean, certainly, um, you know, I got, I got to drive it last week at Monza, which was just fantastic. And uh, it was a real eye opener because, you know, I went there not really knowing what to expect, um, just as far as you know, where the car performance was going to be, uh, which, you know, I think is still a bit of a question mark, but just, you know, it's, it's a brand new program. So I was kind of curious, okay, what's, what's it going to be like? And then the new LMH rules package, like what sort of speed is this going to feel like? And so I had a lot of question marks, but, um, you know, we spent two days testing at Monza. The car was great to drive. Uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've got quite a lot of work to do still. But I was able to get in the car right away and start, you know, driving it like, you know, any other race car and start working on setup. And I think that was one of the best things. It wasn't just brand new car doing out and in laps, trying to work out teething issues. I mean, we were working on performance and uh, it was a really productive test. Well, now your IMSA WeatherTech recent history with Wayne Taylor Racing. That's a, that's a really good parallel, isn't it? Because we're looking at the top class there, which will become LMDH versus hypercar. So where do you think the car places? Is it around the same sort of feel? I mean, without the empirical sort of speeds and so on, yeah. does it feel kind of like the, the Daytona prototypes? It feels pretty close. I think, you know, the one thing I was feeling from the from the LMH uh, Glickenhaus was the, the extra weight that we've got on board. Um, and, and we were running most of the time with pretty full tanks, to be honest, and, and never really, we never went like for outright performance with low fuel and tires. So I never really got to feel the potential of where we are at the moment. So anytime I was out there, the car had the base weight, which is, you know, it's over a thousand kilo plus it's got a pretty big fuel tank too, which adds almost a hundred kilo to that. So uh, plus drivers. So, I mean, it, it gets pretty weighty and, and you feel that a little bit. And I think we need to still work on the setup of the car to adapt to that extra weight. Um, but as far as power, I mean, the engine felt awesome. Uh, Pipo Motor, they're, you know, brand new into this sort of racing. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of the videos and stuff, but the engine just sounds incredible. I mean, it's really good and, and it drives really well. Um, so I think we can still do a lot of tuning on the engine to, to improve the drivability a little bit, but the performance was awesome. And, uh, you know, I was, I was really pleased with it. You've got all these different departments, uh, coming together to work on the car, you know, from, you know, podium engineering that are basically building the car and running the car. Um, but then, you know, we had Sauber uh, F1 aerodynamics and they were involved in the test. And from their side of it, they've been working on the aero and we were doing aero testing in Monza. Uh, you've got Pipo Matur from, from the engine side and, and then you've got Joost, uh, you know, race team uh, with their experience and they come on board and everyone, you know, from what I could tell at the test, everyone was really working well together. Um, just a, a very professional operation. Uh, and, you know, everyone, every, there's so much passion. That's the big thing that stood out for me. I mean, the passion and pride that there is behind this program was what really stood out to me. Everyone involved in the development of this car, just to see the car roll out of the garage and head down the straight, you can just see everyone so excited and proud of what they've achieved so far. And uh, for me as a driver, it makes me proud, even prouder to be a part of the program. So, you know, we had great conversations. I got to meet a lot of great people and uh, yeah, everyone's just like, man, this is the most fun I've had, you know, on a, on a car program in my life. And you've got some guys that have been in F1 for years and uh, everyone's just raving about this program. So, I mean, uh, I think you know, getting to the grid at Le Mans is going to be massive. And obviously it's Spa to begin with, you know, for the whole week season leading up to Le Mans, but it's, it's going to be a lot of fun for everyone involved. 
fun, adventure, enthusiasm. Those are the keys here, aren't they? With the Glickenhaus Hypercar Programme. How can you not want to be wrapped up in it? Well, that's it for our second episode of the 2021 series of WEC Talk. Join us next time out for lots more from behind the scenes in the World Endurance Championship. Until then, stay safe and thank you for listening. Thank you.